Hi, I'm Mr. Wahlberg, and I'm glad you're here. The Kennedy administration faced some of the most dangerous Soviet confrontations in American history. In response to Soviet threats developed in the United States, uh, America became a military superpower. So, dear students, incline your ear and hear our stories that you might find your place among his delights. <laughs> We have three objectives today. By the end of this class, you should be able to identify the factors that contributed to Kennedy's election in 1960. You should be able to describe a public view of the Kennedy White House, and you should be able to describe the military conflicts of the Kennedy administration. But let's begin in Roman numeral number 18. In 1960, President Eisenhower's second term was drawing to a close, and voters were getting restless. The booming economy of the 1950s had turned into a mild recession, and the Soviet Union's launch of Sputnik in 1957 and its development of long-range missiles sparked fears that the American military was falling behind that of the Soviet Union. Further setbacks, including the U-2 incident and the alignment of Cuba with the Soviet Union, had Americans questioning whether the United States was losing the Cold War. The Democratic nominee for president, a Massachusetts senator named John Kennedy, promised active leadership to, in his words, get America moving again. His Republican opponent was the vice president, Richard Nixon, who hoped to win by riding on the coattails of what was otherwise Eisenhower's strong popularity. Sub point B, Americans worried, though, that having a Roman Catholic like Kennedy in the White House would lead either to influence of the Pope on American politics or to having closer ties between the church and state. Anti-Catholic prejudice was still very much a real thing in the American life of the 1960s. Kennedy tried to allay these worries by discussing the issue openly, and even in 1960, going so far as to address a congregation of Protestant clergymen. In the secular and Protestant press, the speech was hailed as triumph for Kennedy, that he would be an independent president and not blindly follow the commands of a pope. In recent years, Catholic writers have noted that the Houston speech also gave license to Catholics to go make their faith life into a private subject that doesn't seem to shape the rest of their identity. Subpoint C. Uh, the most signature thing of the 1960 election was, of course, the televised debates, because Kennedy had a well-organized campaign and the backing of his wealthy family. He was handsome and charismatic, and a, a lot of people felt that, despite that, 43 was too young and he was too inexperienced. If elected, he would be the second youngest president in American history and the youngest to actually win an election. And one event in the fall determined the course of the election, when Kennedy and Nixon took part in the first televised debate uh, between presidential candidates. On September 26, 70 million viewers watched two articulate and knowledgeable candidates debating the issues. Nixon was an expert on foreign policy, and he had agreed to the forum in hopes of exposing Kennedy's inexperience. However, Kennedy had been coached by television producers, and he looked and he spoke better than Nixon did. Kennedy's success in the debate launched the television age in American politics. Sub point D. The election in, in November of 1960 was the closest since the 1884 election, and Kennedy won by fewer than 119,000 votes. His inauguration, though, set a tone for a new era at the White House, one of grace and elegance and wit. It was a sharp contrast from the modest Midwestern years of Truman and Eisenhower. The Kennedys put their popularity and connections to work in full view of the American audiences. Over 100 writers and artists and scientists were invited to his inauguration. Kennedy's inaugural speech called for hope and commitment and sacrifice and inspiring a generation. He proclaimed, and so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. That brings us to Roman numeral 19 and what's often referred to as the Camelot era of American history. Kennedy had a certain mystique to him. During his term, the president and his young, beautiful wife, Jacqueline, invited many artists and celebrities to the White House. In addition, Kennedy often appeared on television. The press loved his charm and wit, and it helped to bolster his own personal image. Critics of Kennedy's presidency argued that his smooth style seemed to lack any real substance, though. And the new, but nevertheless, the new first family fascinated the public. For example, after learning that Kennedy could read 1,600 words a minute, thousands of people started enrolling in speed reading courses. The First Lady, too, captivated the nation with her eye for fashion and culture. She redecorated the White House with American antiques, replacing the department store furniture from the Eisenhower and Truman years, said Truman's White House restoration project. It seemed that the nation just couldn't get enough of the first family. Newspapers and magazines filled their pages with pictures and stories about the president's young daughter, Caroline, and his infant son, John. With JFK's youthful glamour and his talented advisors, the Kennedy White House reminded people of a modern-day Camelot, the mythical court of King Arthur. 
It's that point B. Kennedy surrounded himself with a team of advisors that one journalist called the best and the brightest. They included George Bundy, um, a Harvard University dean, a national, sec national security advisor, Robert McNamara, the president of Ford Motor Company, a secretary of defense, and Dean Russ, the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, a secretary of state. Of all the advisors who filled Kennedy's inner circle, he relied most heavily on his young 35-year-old brother, Robert, whom he appointed to the post of attorney general. Robert's post was somewhat controversial. 35 is young and the smacks of nepotism, uh, but nevertheless, he was confirmed and served as attorney general throughout the Kennedy administration. Roman numeral number 20. From the beginning, Kennedy focused on the Cold War. He thought that the Eisenhower administration hadn't done enough against the Soviet threat. The Soviets, he concluded, were gaining loyalties in the economically less developed third world countries in Asia and Africa and Latin America. He blasted Republicans for allowing communism to America's doorstep in Cuba. Kennedy believed that his most urgent task was to redefine the nation's nuclear strategy. The Eisenhower administration had relied on a policy of massive retaliation to deter a Soviet aggression and imperialism. However, the threatening to use nuclear arms over a minor conflict wasn't a risk that Kennedy wished to take. Instead, his team developed a policy of flexible response that increased military spending to fight a non-nuclear war. Kennedy increased defense spending in order to boost conventional military forces, non-nuclear forces such as troops and ships and artillery, and to create an elite branch of the army called the Special Forces, also known as the Green Berets. He also tripled America's overall nuclear capacity. These changes enabled the United States to go fight limited wars around the world while maintaining a balance of nuclear power with the Soviet Union. Subpoint B. Even as Kennedy hoped to reduce the risk of nuclear war, the world came perilously close to nuclear war under his command as a crisis arose over the island of Cuba, just 90 miles off the coast of Florida. About two weeks before Kennedy took office, President Eisenhower cut off diplomatic relations with Cuba because of a revolutionary leader named Fidel Castro. Castro openly declared himself a communist and he welcomed aid from the Soviet Union. Castro gained power with the promise of democracy and from 1956 to 1959, he led a guerrilla movement to go topple the dictator Eugenio Batista, Fulginio Batista. He won control in 1959 and later told reporters, revolutionaries are not born, they are made by poverty and inequality and dictatorship. Castro then promised to eliminate these conditions from Cuba altogether. The United States was suspicious of Castro's intentions, but nevertheless re, uh, recognized the new government. However, when Castro seized three American and British oil refineries, relations between the, Cubas, between the Cubans and the United States worsened. Castro also broke up commercial farms into communes that would be worked by formerly landless peasants. American sugar companies, which had controlled 75% of the cropland in Cuba, appealed to the United States government for help. In response, Congress erected trade barriers against Cuban sugar. Castro relied on Soviet aid and silencing anybody who didn't agree with him. While some Cubans were taken by his charisma and his willingness to stand up to the United States, others saw Castro as a tyrant who had just replaced one dictatorship with another. About 10% of Cuba's population went into exile, mostly into the United States. The large exile community in Miami um, also found a counter-revolutionary movement taking shape there. And that brings us to subpoint C, the Bay of Pigs. Eisenhower had given the CIA permission to secretly train Cuban exiles for an invasion of Cuba, hoping to trigger a mass uprising that would overthrow Castro. Kennedy learned of the plan only nine days after his election. Although he had his doubts, he approved it. On April uh, 17th, that night of, six, of 1961, some 1,300 to 1,500 Cuban exiles supported by the United States military landed on the island's southern coast at the Bay of Pigs, and nothing went as planned. An airstrike had failed to knock out the Cuban Air Force, although the CIA had reported that it had succeeded. A small advance group sent to distract Castro's forces never actually re reached the shore. While the main unit landed, it lacked American air support and faced 25,000 Cuban troops backed by Soviet tanks and jets. Some of the invading exiles were killed and others imprisoned. The Cuban media sensationalized the defeat of the North American mercenaries. The disaster left Kennedy absolutely embarrassed, and publicly, he accepted blame for the fiasco, but privately, he wondered how could that crowd at the CIA and the Pentagon be this wrong? Kennedy negotiated with Castro for the release of any of the surviving commandos and paid a ransom of $53 million in food and medical supplies. In a speech in Miami, he promised exiles that they would one day return to a free Havana. Although Kennedy warned that he would resist further communist expansion in the Western Hemisphere, Castro defiantly welcomed further Soviet aid. Subpoint D, 
Castro had a powerful ally in Moscow, the Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, who had promised to defend Cuba with Soviet arms. During the summer of 1962, the flow, of Cuban, uh, the flow to Cuba of Soviet weapons, including nuclear missiles, increased greatly. President Kennedy had responded with the warning that America would not tolerate an offensive with nuclear weapons in Cuba. Then, on October 14th, photographs revealed Soviet missile bases in Cuba, some containing missiles which were armed and ready to launch. They could reach the United States cities in just minutes. On October 22nd, Kennedy informed an anxious nation of the existence of Soviet missile sites in Cuba and of his plans to remove them. He made it clear that any missile attack from Cuba would t trigger an all-out attack on the Soviet Union. For the next six days, the world faced the terrifying possibility of nuclear war. In the Atlantic Ocean, Soviet ships, presumably carrying more missiles, headed towards Cuba, while the United States prepared to quarantine Cuba and prevent ships from coming within 500 miles of it. In Florida, 100,000 troops waited, the largest American invasion ever assembled. And the first break in the crisis occurred when Soviet ships stopped suddenly to avoid a confrontation at sea. Secretary of State Dean Rusk said, we are eyeball to eyeball, and the other fellow just blinked. A few days later, Khrushchev offered to remove the missiles in order for an American pledge not to invade Cuba. The United States also secretly agreed to move missiles from Turkey. The leaders agreed, and the crisis, which, narrowly, which was just about to become a, a, a nuclear war, was narrowly averted. Subpoint E. The crisis damaged Khrushchev's prestige in the Soviet Union and in the world. Kennedy didn't escape criticism either. Some people criticized Kennedy for practicing brinksmanship when private talks might have resolved the crisis without the threat of nuclear war. Others believed he'd passed up on his ideal chance to invade Cuba and oust Castro. The effects of the crisis lasted long after the missiles had been removed. Many Cuban exiles blamed the Democrats for losing Cuba to the Rep and switched to the Republican Party. Meanwhile, Castro closed Cuba's doors to exiles in November of 1962 and banned all flights to and from Miami. Three years later, hundreds of thousands of people took advantage of an agreement that allowed Cubans to join relatives in the United States. And Castro also emptied his prisons of criminals and asylums of the mentally ill by calling them refugees and shipping them to the United States. By the time Castro had, uh, by the time Castro had sharply cut down on exit permits by 1973, the Cuban population in Miami had increased to about 300,000 people. So point F, one goal that guided Kennedy through the Cuban Missile Crisis was that of proving to Khrushchev of his determination to control communism. All the while, Kennedy was thinking of the recent confrontation over Berlin, which had handed, uh, which had led to the construction of the Berlin Wall, a concrete topped wall a concrete wall topped with barbed wire that had severed the city into two. In 1961, Berlin was a great city in great turmoil. In the 11 years since the Berlin airlift, often 3 million East Germans, about 20% of the country's population, had fled into West Berlin because it was free from communist rule. Those refugees advertised the failure of East Germany's communist government, and their departure dangerously weakened that country's economy. Khrushchev realized that this was a problem and had to be solved. At a summit meeting in Vienna, Austria in June of 1961, he threatened to sign a treaty with East Germany that would enable the country to close all access roads to West Berlin. When Kennedy refused to give up American access to West Berlin, Khrushchev furiously declared, I want peace, but if you want war, that is your problem. After returning home, Kennedy pledged, we cannot and will not permit the communists to drive us out of Berlin. Kennedy's determination and American superior nuclear striking power had prevented Khrushchev from closing the air and land routes between West Berlin and West Germany. Instead, the Soviet premier surprised the world with a shocking decision. Just after midnight on August 13th of 1961, East German troops began to unload the concrete posts and barbed wire along the border, and within days, the Berlin Wall was erected, separating West Germany from East Germany. The Berlin Wall ended the Berlin crisis, but it further aggravated Cold War tensions. Refugees, um, you know, slowed to a tiny trickle, thus solving Khrushchev's main problem. At the same time, however, the wall became an ugly symbol of communist oppression. Subpoint G. Showdowns between Kennedy and Khrushchev made both leaders aware of the gravity of split-second decisions and separated the Cold War peace from nuclear disaster. Kennedy, in particular, searched for ways to tone down his hardliner rhetoric. 
1963, he announced the two nations had established a hotline between the White House and the Kremlin. This dedicated phone enabled leaders of the two countries to communicate at once if any crisis arose. Later that year, the United States and the Soviet Union also agreed to a limited test ban treaty that barred nuclear testing in the atmosphere. The conflict between East and West, between communist uh, countries and democratic capitalism, wouldn't be solved. Tensions would sometimes escalate, sometimes slow down as the United States enters the 1960s. This is a fascinating story that I can't wait to tell you more about. Make sure you like and subscribe. Smash that bell. God bless you.